All right, special episode of the Barbarian Hour. Tonight we have two-time All-American Jacob Casper from uh, Duke, a Duke Blue Devil. It's a du- it's Duke University, right? You're right, yeah, Duke University. I love all your Duke uh, paraphernalia. It almost looks like you have two singlets hanging on the wall, even though it's one. Yeah, one singlet and then uh, one big frame picture. Coach Lanham gave me all that when I was uh, my senior banquet or whatever. So it was actually put away in storage for a long time. And I, you know, I read this weird thing like ESPN did on Kale or something. They said, like, there's nothing displayed in this house. You would have never known that, like, Kale Sanderson lived there except for, like, an ESPY or something. So I was, like, very much that mindset. Like, got to put everything behind me and then started doing, like, some podcasts and some interviews and stuff. And I'm like, I need a room set up to be able to do this stuff out of. So. That's why it all made a return. We've got this room decorated with stuff now. It looks like two singlets because you have a mirror. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, we got that's in the mirror <laughs> closet. I think he's got I two also, singlets hanging yeah, up. I built I this room also, so I put that mirror closet in. You did that? I did that, yeah. I'm renovating a house, too, in my free time right now. Nice. So you're handy. Uh, I try to be. Okay. So let's just talk about this. Not, not, Not this. This guy. There you go. The shirt, right? <laughs> we got the Jacob hey. Casper shirt on. This is my time to shine and talk about this. I wear this shirt all the time, as the armpits would probably tell you. Okay, I wear <laughs> this shirt a lot. Um, you sent me this one and a black one, right? Right. Dude, you're always sending me things. You sent me a pair of Kent State wrestling shoes that I don't know. Somehow you got them on, like, probably Oh, I forgot about right? that, yeah. Yeah, dude, I still owe you for that. I owe you... <laughs> You're always giving. There it is. You see all those shoes? That's that's still my thing. Wrestling shoes are still my thing. I'm Courtney, my fiance, she'll be here. The wrestling shoes will come in. She's like, You're not even competing anymore. Why are you still buying wrestling shoes? I'm like, I'm a collector. It's not hoarding, it's collecting. Well, yeah, I mean, my wife would say very much uh different. Uh you know what ones I keep seeing? Uh Ian, my what? nephew. Ian, my nephew got a pair stolen out of his locker at Kent State that I gave him with the name on them, and they keep making the rounds. And they're they're blue runs, blue blue blue, blue runs. Well, is that what we would call a blue rulon? Yeah, I like it. Okay, so they're the blue rulons. They're destroyed, and they're still selling them for like three hundred bucks. I was gonna say I've seen them. I've seen them on sites before, so I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, those were Ian's, and, and and of course, in typical Ian fashion, he didn't go clean his locker out or whatever. Whatever happened, and he just, oh, everybody just took his stuff, I think, because he just didn't care. And then I'll see him, and I'm always like, hey, those are my shoes, literally. And you sent me the pair you sent me. You must have got from, like, Keith Witt or someone, I think. I, I don't remember exactly. I think I bought those off eBay or something, to be honest. Like, they popped up, and, like, I used to have notifications go off whenever a new pair was listed in like certain sizes and they must've popped up like buy it now. And I bought them real quick. I think that's how I came across those. Well, I owe you, I owe you multiple shirts. I owe you shoes. I owe you a lot, Jacob. I, I'm not going to lie to you. You've always been giving, I need to start giving back, but um, currently you live in Orlando, correct? Currently in Orlando, but Zeb, you've done a lot for the sport. I can never give you enough to repay you for everything you did for the sport that we love so much. So I think we're equal at the very least. I I, I totally disagree. I'm, I have zero, <laughs> I have zero TV appearances. Okay, um, you have multiple. Um, thinking of which, I your last NCAA tournament, um, my best memory. I want to say you headlocked. Sam stole in like a minute and pinned him in the Concy semis. Is that Am I getting the round right and the city right? Yep. Yep. Cleveland 2018, Sam stole Concy semis. Yeah, it was like a minute something. Minute six, I believe. You ripped this nasty. <laughs> it was a righty, right? Righty headlock? No, no, it was a lefty. Yeah. You get under the lefty headlock? Yeah. <laughs> well, dude, I'm in the I'm in the tunnel for all that stuff, you know, for 10 plus years and it is the most intense place to be on earth. I mean, you know, that that area right there is just like the when you walk out the four ways you can walk out, usually four ways you can walk out. Depends what arena you're in. Those are some of the most intense moments ever, man. And then the I, the post interviews are always awesome too. I love those. You were cutting promos yeah. in 2018 in Cleveland. I loved it. Yeah, it was those were those were the moments I lived for, you know. I didn't 
in college, I didn't go out and drink. I didn't party. I didn't do any of that stuff. You know, I spent all my free time pursuing a goal. I went all in on that goal. You know, uh, I came short of that goal. But the thing that makes me able to lay my head down at night and look myself in the mirror was that I gave it everything I had. But those were the moments I lived for. I stayed up thinking about giving those interviews or walking out in that arena. I think that's probably the closest thing, you know, maybe a UFC walk, but that's got to be right there neck and neck with it to like what it was like to walk out in the Coliseum back in like the gladiator days and stuff. Like, I honestly believe that, like you said, it's so tense. Like, you know, I, I didn't get my high from doing drugs. I didn't get my high from drinking. Like that was an adrenaline high. That was a rush. That was fun to know you were going to be out there with the chance to, you know, slay giants, especially like, I felt like I was such an underdog. Like that was what gave me, you know, a breath of air, like being able to go out and perform and do that on a high level with, you know, I know my dad was so passionate about the sport. I know my family was so proud of me for competing the way I did. And I also got to carry, uh, you know, the, the logo for a small university that didn't have a lot of representation on my back. So I took a lot of pride in those things. And that, that was a lot of fun. Those were a lot of fun memories, even if, you know, you ultimately came short of your goals. What's wild for me is um, you were an activist at the same time because you guys did not have scholarships. You did not have wrestling athletic scholarships at Duke. And I remember when you got on the podium that year, I want to say it was, it was that year, right? It was 2018 in Cleveland. You wore the shirt, you know, give Duke wrestlers scholarships, right? Yeah. So I, I actually, I got those shirts printed um, like last second. I went to the guys on the team. I think it was me and the four fine silvers that year at NCAA. So we had half our team there. I'm like we have no scholarships. And we got half our team at NCAAs, which most other programs, you know, with 10 scholarships don't even have. So, or 9.9, whatever you're allowed to have. So 9 .9. I was yeah, like, 9 .9. Look, I'm like, this is what I want to do guys. You know, I'm on my way out. There's nothing they can do to me. I'm untouchable essentially at this point. What are they going to do? Pull my scholarship. I don't have one. I'm graduating. So what are they going to do? Like, they can't punish me next year. And they were like, Hey, we're all in for it. I'm like, dang, these guys got to come back. Like it's going to put a target on their back. So we get the shirts printed. We don't tell the coaches and then we warm up in them. And then it starts going around social media that we're wearing them. So the AD calls right away and is like, Hey, tell those guys to take that, those shirts off. They're not wearing them, blah, blah, blah. So I was like, look, I told our coaches, it was either coach Whistler or coach Lanham. Uh, I'm like, look, if you want me to take it off, I'll take it off. But if it's because Dr. White or, John Jackson want me to take it off. I'm not taking it off. Like, and then, you know, Hey, let's, let's focus on competing. We'll, we'll deal with that. Uh, at other times we want you to take it off. Cool. So I took it off. I wrestled the tournament. And then, uh, as the award ceremony was going on, I went up to coach Lanham afterwards. I said, Hey, I'm telling you out of respect, you know, uh, I'm not really asking permission. I'm just kind of letting you know, as a heads up, I'm wearing the shirt on the podium and I'm going to open it up. And he was like, no, I appreciate you letting me know. Like, there's not much I can do to stop you. You know, your career's over. I said, all right, cool. And just went out and did it. Did they ever do anything about that? Are they on? Are there any? No. N not. I got called. I got called into the athletic director's office like two days after I got back. Everything. Yeah, they were not happy. And that made me a very big enemy in, in the Duke University athletic department. Well, what's crazy to me is weren't you a coach at Duke and an RTC athlete the following year? I was RTC athlete through uh, NC State and I was coaching at Duke. Yeah, for a very short amount of time. And I'm guessing that might have contributed to that short stint at Duke as a coach. I just never had the best relationship with administration after that. Safe to say. <laughs> I'll tell you what. I like Glenn Lanham. I think he's a great guy. And uh, I, they're doing the most with the least. If you look at it, they're in the ACC. They're sixth in the ACC constantly because the other five teams are in the arms race with all the other power fives, right? Look at the facilities at UVA, Pitt. Virginia, Virginia Tech, NC State, right? Like North Carolina. Look, look, look at the facilities. Look at, look at gear. Look at everything. Look at travel budgets. Look at, obviously, everybody's got 9.9 .9 out of those guys. It, it, it's like the guy's able to put together teams that are competitive and have guys qualify for the tournament every year when they got no scholarships and they're consistently the sixth team for a reason, right? Yeah. I mean, they weren't 16 when I was there. Uh, no, well, you, know, you we guys weren't, we weren't Go ahead. You guys beat Who did you guys? Did you beat They beat Pitt last year. They beat, they beat Pitt, Pitt last, last year. year. We beat everybody except I think VTech when I was in school. And we came down to the final match against VTech two or three times. We beat State, we beat Well, yeah, we beat everybody, I think. 
uh, at some point while I was in college. And, you know, I, I came in 2013, 2014 season. We had an All-American. So we the six years I was there, the five years on the team, and the one year on staff, we had an All-American every single year. So that's, that's we, we did a lot during that time. What, how are they able to do that? Because, like, it, it's weird what the Ivies do. Um, the six Ivies that have wrestling, that's all need-based, okay? Right. So you either have mega rich kids or you have kids that whose parents make below 120 grand a year, whatever the, whatever the threshold is, and 170, whatever it is, is a combined household income. And then it's need-based and you pay according to your FAFSA, right? Does Duke do right. that? Does Duke do that? Is there, is like, there is some need-based, but like, to be honest, it's not super competitive with those programs. They probably tell you like admissions like it is, but like from what I found, it wasn't super competitive. But what we had was we had a group of kids that got white collar opportunities by going to Duke University, but they were like blue collar dudes, you know, they came in. And they were all on the same mission. Every single All-American we had, Hartman, Fine Silver, me, they were all, all the same way. Like, nothing else mattered. We went to school, and we did our schoolwork, and we all got really good grades because it allowed us to get back in the wrestling room and in the weight room to spend more time. Like, that was our everything. We went all in on that goal. And looking back on that time, you know, there's a lot of guys that didn't even reach All-American status. So I'm sure it's funny to hear me say, like, you know, I came short of my goal when you have guys that didn't get on the podium that did the exact same. Didn't even get to the tournament that did the exact same. But we had a core group of guys during that time. Dylan Ryan, Cole Baumgartner, you know, Emmanuel Kerr-Brown, Brandon Gambucci, Jake Faust. We had a group of guys that came in there and just really changed the culture for, you know, the stint that we were there uh, while battling uphill with administration, while battling uphill with all those things that we didn't have. And, like, it's funny now, you know, they, they redid the wrestling room. They redid the weight room. They redid the locker room. And I don't think any of those guys that are there now realize what we were able to do um, with so much less than them. And it's like, we had a chip on our shoulders though. Whenever we walked into a room, you know, you knew you were going to, you weren't going to punk us and then we were going to come to compete. We were going to wrestle hard. That was kind of like the reputation of our program. We took a lot of pride in that. Why do you think they're sixth now consistently in the, in the ACC? I think it takes someone, uh, you know, that walks in, with their chest up, with their chin out, you know, their, their toes down and they're ready to work and, and has that swagger and brings the confidence for the rest of the team. And right now, you know, I think they're struggling to find that one guy that, you know, when the duel is, you know, nine matches are wrestled in the duel and it's tied going into the last match that wants to be the one going out there. You got to have that one guy that wants to go out there. And, uh, you know, during our stint, we had a couple guys that were like that. They have a couple guys right now who are competitive, but you have to have that one that kind of pushes everybody else over the top, I think. Chip on your shoulder, a little bit of swagger. No, they're, hey, we're not scholarship guys. Our facility isn't the best facility in the ACC, but we can still win. Something like that, you'd say? Yeah. I mean, you, you got to, you know, I kind of cut the promo on it in 2018. You can look at all that stuff. Is this the reason why I'm not going to win? Or hey, this is going to be so much sweeter when I win, when I do it without all this stuff. And, like, that was the way we viewed it. And, you know, that was the way we approached every single day. Like, I can't wait to prove everybody wrong. Like, I remember when I told the team or whatever, and like, a small group of guys, hey, I'm going up to heavyweight after this thing. Like, I'm going to go chase Snyder. And there was two or three of them right away that was like, you can beat this dude. And that's all, you know, I already had a fire going, and they put gasoline on it. I'm like, I got these guys backing me. And that's what we did for each other. And we were able to, to feed and fuel off of that. And that's why instead of one guy going to the tournament and winning, you had five going to the tournament and winning matches. That's why instead of whatever they finished this year, you know, we were a top 20 program for a couple of years. Like, I think that's what it takes. I think it takes a small group of game changers coming in at the same time. So you were an all-time great uh, heavyweight weight class two times. 2017, 2018, both brackets, you're an All-American, you're sixth in 2017 and fourth in 2018, correct? Correct. And in both of those brackets, it was Kyle Snyder that won, right? Correct. He dropped me in the semis both years. <laughs> you you had him in the semis both years? Yeah. It was the one guy I couldn't get past. I'd like to catch him on the big stage, see if maybe he's afraid of the heights on the elevated platform. <laughs> the uh, result would have been a little different. Yeah. The uh... – yeah, yeah, hey, maybe he can uh, come out there and do some work in Orlando with you guys, and you can get get a little bit of back on him, right? Yeah, I, I need some something to get back on him. <laughs> well, I mean, what's crazy about him is he's still at it, right? He's still 
won the world title last year, and now he's going to have to square off with Sadulayev again if he can, you know, win the final X spot from Jaden Cox. Hey, did Hartman beat Jaden Cox the one year in the Conci semis? Is that what happened? Am I am I remembering that correctly? Close. Uh, they both dropped to the the Conci fifth sixth place match, and then went to OT. I think. Six. Yeah, yeah, and Cox beat him for fifth, sixth, and it was like super like competitive overtime match because Hartman wrestled similar to Cox did, and then you know I think Cox went on to oh I know for a fact Cox went on to not be very happy afterwards and like gave an interview or something like complaining about it, and then Monday when we get back from NCAA's it was taped up on our lockers. They don't they don't expect you to win, and that's what the coaches did. So like. Kind of what I was saying about the guys that had fuel to the fire. The coaches did that too. Like they wanted us to have that swagger and that intensity. Yeah. I mean, it, you got to have that. And it, whether you're, whatever your situation is, they were doing with the best with what they had with, you know, with the no scholarship situation. And I, I like that you guys had that chip on your shoulder, man. I like that you didn't back down and take a, a back seat to anyone. I, I think that that's essential. If you don't believe you can win, if you think you can, or you think you can't, you're right. Yeah, Henry Ford. Either way, right? Either way, if you think you can, you can. If you think you can't, you can't. That's just that's just my my. That's a great philosophy, I think. Yeah, no, I agree. And you know, at the time, we had Ben Whistle on staff, we had Coach Lanham on staff, and we had a group of guys that believed that. And you know, the the stuff that you would come in on the weekends, it was always kind of funny. Like you didn't know what was going to be taped up outside your locker or in the back room. You know what was going to get taped up, and you know some of the guys. You know, maybe didn't take it as personal, but I, I take everything personal. Uh, I take everything, you know, everything anybody would say about me. I remember one year they said, like, oh, that's great. Duke's got qualifiers. Like, uh, get back to me when they have a title contender. And I went back, whatever, when I was, like, the three or the four seed at NCAAs one year. I went back and liked that tweet just so that they knew that I knew, you know, years later. Like, I was real petty like that. But, yeah, I mean, it, it it was fun. It, it, I'm still that way. Uh, you know, I, I cut the promo in 2018 talking about, like, I'm just a kid from down the road in Mansfield, Ohio, essentially, like, who's not supposed to be here. Like, Lexington had a great program. I wasn't one of the great guys at the time. I wasn't one of the guys that the coaches were spending time with. Like, I did all that kind of, uh, I don't know if it was despite or in spite of them, but, you know, it put a chip on my shoulder at a really young age. I wanted to prove to everybody that, like, I had something different. I always felt like, always felt like from a young age I was destined for something big something great and you know I haven't had that moment where I get to run and jump in my coach's arms on the elevated stage or whatever but you know I'm hoping in this new career that it'll, it'll come true so you were fourth once um for coach Rastetter Brett Rastetter at Lexington did I is that correct or did you place twice I placed twice yeah what'd you take the what'd you take the other year so I took so uh I wrestled 119, 140, uh, 170, 182. I made it to – or I was 0-2 at sectionals at 119. I was 0-2 at districts at 140. I was supposed to make it to state. Like, I was – whatever, it was the Brakeman Report. I was, like, number 12 in the Brakeman Report. Um, but I actually had lost the four guys coming out of my sectional my junior year. And I ended up taking third at uh, sectionals, third at districts, and I ended up fourth at state. Uh, we went 1-2, uh, 4 at – state out of our district and then the next year i was projected state champ and i ended up third so you're fourth and third junior year fourth senior year third who won your weights those two years um chris moore and aaron adkins who i had wins over <laughs> so wait chris moore was the clyde dude right yep that was wild. Who did he beat? Did he beat a clear fork guy in the finals? Yep. My I, a dude that wrestled in the conference with me, Brandon O'Neill. That's wild. I, yeah, when he won that weight, that was wild for me because that was 2012, wasn't it? 2012, yep. So Chris Moore had a dude that they wheeled right up next to the mat that I want to say was his cousin, another Clyde guy named Bubba Andrews. Bubba Andrews yep. had brain cancer. And he was on the edge of the mat. And Clyde's in O'Carver's conference. And I didn't even recognize Bubba because he was under so much treatment. And they were, he had yeah. chemo and he ended up passing. But, like, that was kind of a crazy thing for me to watch because Bubba Andrews got to be on the side of the mat, watch another Clyde guy win. That was your weight, though. That's crazy. I did not realize that. Yeah, that was my weight. I lost to Chris Moore in the semis in, in a decent match. Um, and then the next year I lost to Steven Saglio in the semis. So I'm 0-4 in the – 
the semis of. I thought you said this interview was going to make me feel good. You started to make me feel kind of bad now. Because <laughs> uh, you're petty like that. You just said it. Uh, hey, I, I, you know, uh, my buddy Paul Baumgartner put out a tweet. He said, you know, I, I got pinned going for the state title in seventh grade or whatever. And everyone told me like 10 years from now, you know, nobody will remember this. Nobody will think about it. He said, why does it still keep me up at night or something like that? It's the same damn thing for me. I think about all those losses still when I'm headed into work. When I don't want to go hard, all that stuff still is fueling me. So it, it's all right. I hung out with Bummy this summer in Iowa. Is he in Minnesota right now? Is that where he is? Yeah, Shakopee. Yeah, yeah in Minnesota. Yeah, I like him. Cole Co- Co- Vungardner is really cool. <laughs> He's a good dude. I'm flying out actually in two days to go to his wedding. So Really good dude. Yeah, that's awesome. Congrats to him. Shout out to him. He was at the uh, Street League thing for uh, Stalemates. Yep, yep. <laughs> um, okay, did you do OAC stuff? Were you an OAC guy at all? I tried. <laughs> you ever make it to state in the OAC? So um, I went through a weird stretch. Like, I think it was third grade I wrestled 80 or 85. Fourth grade I wrestled 90. Fifth grade I wrestled 90. Sixth grade I wrestled 95. Seventh grade I wrestled 92. Eighth grade I wrestled 98. So there was a stretch where I just, like, really didn't grow. Um, and I tried to go to, to grade school state, junior high state every single year. Um, my eighth grade year, I lost the match to go to Elijah Garcia, I think, from Elyria. Um, and then my seventh grade year, I lost to, I don't remember, John Hood, maybe from Mentor and the way to go and the uh, match to go mentor. Um, and then there was one year that I did make it, though. My brothers were both going and, and my older brother wrestled uh, Connor Witt one year at, at junior high state um from oak harbor and then my little brother was placing and projected grade school state champ and everything else he was a maniac mark hall would fly in to wrestle him even though he wasn't wrestling year round because he was that good um but my fifth grade year or sixth grade year we get to the district tournament and it was only me and quentin hiles in the weight so i went by default one year because i ended up second at the district to quentin hiles he ended up like decking me or something in the district finals Quentin Hiles is state champ. Quentin Hiles is good. And my draw at the state tournament that year was Seth Williams on the backside because I lost to somebody else who ended up being a high school state champ too. Seth Williams is state champ for Colombian, right? Yep. Yeah. So like I was just talking to uh, Bronson Steiner about this, actually. Like even when you go back to junior high and stuff, it looked like I didn't have a lot of success. Grade school, I didn't have a lot of success. But when I look back, almost all of these dudes wrestled D1. Like afterwards, I was wrestling like D1 caliber guys all the way through. I went like 0 and 60 one summer trying to wrestle freestyle and Greco, but it was because I was wrestling like Anthony Colica and uh, Mitch Newhouse and every, that was my bracket every single weekend. I would just go and wrestle the same couple dudes. What's crazy about you is um, it's always been about ex- explosion of growth, right? Whether it was OEC, grade school, junior high, right? Where you were right around 80s, 90 pounds. And then you jumped into 119, and then you got to 140, 71, 82, whatever the weights were then, right? Like, you've always grown. Yeah. And then when you made the jump to heavyweight, it was your third year, you and you were a 184-pounder, right? Yeah, I went 184. I was, like, 15 and 16 uh, my true freshman year. I went 184. I was, like, 26 and 12. I made the tournament. Uh, I wrestled Jack Deckow on the top side and Nico Reyes on the back side. And uh, I was having a real, real hard time making weight that year. But the coaches wouldn't let me wrestle Hartman off because he was a returning All-American, even though I felt like I could beat him. And they were like, no, like make 84 for the team this year, blah, blah, blah. I said, hey, if that's what you want, I'll do whatever. They were the only guys that were willing to give me a shot to wrestle D1. So I was willing to do anything for Coach Lanham and Coach Whistle. And uh, I remember the day that I decided I was going heavyweight. It was Southern Scuffle. I got last call to the scale on day one, and then I had to drill with Lanham and Dylan Ryan uh, day two to make weight again. And I was getting last call to the scale again. And he's telling me off. Lanham's telling me off. And he says, like, uh, I said, I'm sorry, coach. Like, this is unprofessional, but I've never had problems making weight before. I don't know what's wrong with me. I didn't realize I'd just been growing still because, like, I hit puberty super late. He's like, don't worry about it. You make weight the rest of this year. You don't have to do it anymore. I took it as you never have to make weight again. He meant, apparently, that I didn't have to make 97 again. Uh, so when I came back, there was that miscommunication. I'm like, I'm going heavyweight. He's like, don't you want to certify at 97? I said, nah. I said, plan B takes away from plan A. We're going heavyweight this year. He said, we're bringing in Michael Johnson, the number one 
recruited heavyweight in the country or whatever, I said, well, I hope he's happy redshirting because this is my weight for the next couple of years. So, and that was kind of how I ended up at heavyweight. So you never, did you ever wrestle a year at 97? Never wrestle a year at 97. It's all 84, 84, 84, 90, uh, heavyweight, heavyweight. Right. And what, yep. was you, what was your typical weigh-in at like uh ACC tournament, a dual me, the NCAAs, whatever. What was your typical weigh in weight? Uh, so like my junior year, I started to let it get in my head. Oh no, you're only 217. You're too light. You need to drink some water. So then I'd be like over hydrating before weigh ins and stuff and like started worrying about it a whole lot. Then I got to the point where I just didn't care anymore. But like 217 probably wasn't unusual. 218. I got as big my senior year as like 227, 228. Um, and then I had a Crohn's flare up and it took me down to like, I wrestled the last day of NCAAs, my senior year at uh, 210. So you are, what are you now? What do you weigh now? I like 235, closer to 240. 235 now. Yeah, I'm, I'm heavier now than I've ever been. <laughs> How do you feel? Do you feel good? Man, I you, you know what scares up is like, I think I hit puberty late and I think that right now I'm probably in my athletic prime and it, it, it you know, it, I don't want to say it bothers me. I don't want to say it keeps me up at night, but I'd kind of be lying if I didn't say both things. Like you, I was watching this thing on Kurt Angle, right? And they said that Kurt didn't win his first uh, world title till he was 27. He didn't win the Olympics till he was 28. I signed with WWE when I was 25. So right, I, I gave away maybe some of my prime with that. You know, my, I'm tight, real close with DC. DC didn't fight for the first time until he was 30. Yeah, And I'm looking, I'm like, man, I hit puberty late. Like, I could be doing a lot of my numbers are higher than they've ever been. My conditioning. I'm a, I'm a machine right now, to be honest. Like I, I really feel like I could do something special. So when you say, you know, you said you had a, you had a Crohn's flare up, right? You, you said that how many different, you know, and you've said that in interviews before I've done with you, how, what is the battle like with Crohn's disease? Cause it's an intestinal disease, right? Am I getting that right? Yeah. Gastrointestinal disease, it's autoimmune thing. So like, the best way a lot of other people describe it, and I guess I would agree with that, is it's kind of like the worst flu you've ever had, but it just keeps going. It's not a two- or three-day bug that gets out of your system. It keeps going. You know how your body aches, how your joints hurt? Like, your body's literally attacking itself. It doesn't want to keep anything down. So there was the one year at uh, ACC's, I was 227, um, started throwing up at the tournament before each match. I'm like, dude, I don't feel like I'm this nervous. What's going on? Turns out I was starting to flare up just because of stress and everything, I think. Um, and then it was my senior year. And then by the time I made it to the tournament, I was like 210. Um, so you're talking about a week and a half. I lost like 18 pounds. Uh, couldn't keep anything down. Couldn't eat, couldn't drink. You know, you can't sleep. Your skin like is real hot all the time. Like you're sick, like, uh, like with a fever. So it's just, it's kind of a miserable experience. I've, I've flared up like three times, uh, pretty severely. And those, those three times were very challenging. What are, what's the, is there medication every day for that? Like, how do you treat Crohn's disease? Yeah, there are immunosuppressants and stuff that people are on. When you're in a flare up, you know, you're typically on like uh, prednisone or some type of steroid to get the inflammation and everything out. And, you know, uh, Crohn's disease kind of has a progression over time. You know, it's, it gets worse for a lot of people. So you'll start on, on one type of medicine um, and then you'll eventually progress to more. I was on like Lialda and then azathioprine and then actually, uh, I was coaching junior duels in 2017, maybe, with, uh, you know, Team Ohio. And I got stuck in a room with Dr. Matten. And that's that's a whole funny story in and of itself because, of, like, Disney duels, I thought I hated the Mattens. I thought they hated me. I got stuck in a room with Dr. Matten. And, and we talked about how he had some gastrointestinal problems and how he basically thought with some of those immunosuppressants I was on that I shouldn't probably be on those while wrestling in college because – they were linked to like increased cancer risk, uh, bone, uh, like brittleness. Um, and then obviously like with an immunosuppressant, your immune system's not functioning to be in a room with 40 other dudes sweating on close contact like that, probably not a good idea. So he recommended that I start documenting what I was eating and finding out what was triggering me, um, both diet wise and not diet wise. So I took that pretty seriously and I pinpointed it pretty good. I've been able to manage, you know, knock on wood for the most part, uh, since then. What is the triggers? Do we know? Man, yeah, mine are all over the place. So I get like this underlying travel anxiety, which is hilarious, right? Because like I was traveling all the time to compete and stuff. Um, it's just like the idea of like you're away from home, you're away from what you need maybe a little bit. Um, and then 
as far as like dietary and stuff, it's like a matter of uh, black beans. I can't eat it all. Any type of painkiller, like I struggle with like acetaminophen or ibuprofen, uh, black beans, like I said, completely off the table. Most other things I can do in moderation, like uh, pork I can do in moderation, uh, red sauce, whether it's pasta or pizza, I can do in moderation, like orange juice I can do in moderation. But if I go extreme with any of those things, they'll mess me up too. What about pinto beans? <laughs> pinto beans i'm fine thus that's far. crazy I'm right like I, you say that and i'm like what about pinto beans yeah i am double pinto beans at chipotle every single time so there you go there you go uh your uh your guy nemeth your guy dolph ziggler nemeth is uh he's double chicken double chicken kind of guy the double chicken guy. Like that guy that. like that, that guy likes chicken me. he likes his filet mignons uh dirt cheap in arizona now i know that um, hey, let me ask you this, Zeb. If me and Dolph Ziggler lock up in the squared circle, who are you pulling for? I know he was your college teammate. Pulling for? I know he's your guy. I know he comes on. He does podcasts. He does commentary with you. But I've sent you shirts. I've sent you shoes. Who are you pulling for in the Dolph Ziggler, Dolph Ziggler Julius Creed match? Wait, is it the – hold on, dude. Hold on. You got to stop right now. Is it a real wrestling match in, like, the Lexington or the St. Edward Room? Now I want I want Madison Square Garden WWE okay. match main event. Talking, okay, dude, I don't want to like belittle what you guys do. It's amazing. I know I know you guys take real bumps. I just don't know anything about it. Um, but I I mean, is it bad if I go? With, is it bad if I go with my guy? I mean, what? what I, oh, he sent you a card. I got cards over in this drawer. I'll be sending you some hold cards. On, hold on, hold on, hold on. Some for you and for. Look here, here we go, here we go. We got that one. I got like I got a signed one. I got a graded one. Okay, so here's what I was talking to him about a couple weeks ago. He was up here. I mean, in a real match, you'd murder him. You'd, you'd steal his soul out of his body. How about that? <laughs> hey, I I, I need him to help build me, so I need to go over in this match. So okay, okay, yeah. I mean, but that's his thing, though. I'm not above like, buying your your vote. Okay, so my thing. I mean, if we're talking real wrestling, I mean, you'd you'd break his old man, forty two year old hip. But if we're talking like a match, like a work to work, he's the best guy to work with, right? Like, the, like he's notoriously, hold on, he's famously like one of the best workers in the game that he puts a lot of people over and launches a lot of people, right? He's one of the best of all time. Yeah. And it's cool to look around and see, you know, you see these people who have success early on or sustained success or are at the top, and so many of them have a wrestling background. You know, I, I'd put – Chad Gable up there with Dolph Ziggler right now, the work that he's been doing recently too. I'm, I'm a huge fan of both of those guys. I love Dolph Ziggler. I loved the little bit. I got to pick his brain while he was down in NXT. Uh, you know, I love Chad Gable. I, I would love to learn from and work with those guys at any point in my career. I saw Chad Gable at the 2012 Olympics. Cause I was there in London. He fived a dude from like Mauritius, Mauritius or something. He fived the dude at the Olympics. It was awesome. Um, Dude, I hate it when I can't remember like real names because gimmick names take over. <laughs> yeah. Chat uh, uh, I love it. Um, no, I mean in a match, I think that you're ultimately really gonna gain so much from working with, with Nick Nam. I dude, I struggle with calling him Dolph Ziggler. I'm sorry. I just I do. <laughs> no worries. So, one, of my, one of my great friends. I talk to him, text him every day. Um, you know, hang out with him, you know, a couple times a year and I cut trees down for his dad over in, uh, on the west side of Cleveland. They're just great people. They're really good people. Um, great guy. Um, but I think the biggest thing, you're you're massive. You're really a huge guy. Like, you're, what are you, 6'3"? I'm, I'm a legit 6'3", yeah. Yeah, you're every like, bit On any physical where I'm barefoot. <laughs> yeah, you're you're 6'3", six, 6'4". Six, um, I mean, I remember, like, Seeing you as a high schooler and being like, man, that dude's really big and rangy, right? Because I, you know, I covered the state tournament and your coach is a great guy. Coach Rastetter is a great guy. Um, and I remember thinking, man, that guy's going to be massive in college. That guy's a 97 heavyweight all day. Because that's kind of my thing. You know what I mean? I look at guys and I try and like sure. size up where they're going to be moving forward. It's like now the big one I look at is like Marcus Blaze. Is Marcus Blaze going to be a, I think he's going to be a 49 pounder, maybe even a 57. And, and he's going to be really, really good. But like, tough. <laughs> he's he's really tall, and they're the the they're like you though physically because they're they're late bloomers physically, dude. That's what's wild about the Blazes. They're not. They're not okay. You're way back from them physically, but.
But now as a man and what you grew into in college and as a, you know, junior, senior high school, you're just like the, the consummate and the definition of a late bloomer, in my opinion. Yeah, but like you, it's it, so there's so many kids in Ohio, right, that that peak early and that are big and that they wrestle in high school, uh, do really, really well, and then they don't go on to do well. But like the amazing thing is, these guys, like you know, the easy examples like David Taylor, someone that jumps a whole bunch of weights, yeah. like 103 to 135 or whatever, and has success. But you got other guys like Brock Herman and stuff. Like I coached Brock when he was like a real little kid, and you're seeing it with him, like these Blaze kids, like. They're, they're, they're jumping weights, but they're winning even when they're small. It took me jumping weights and, like, I had to be the old kid in high school. I had to be the old kid in college before I could start to win. They're winning the entire time. Like, it is so crazy to me. Well, and the other thing, like, I, I look at, like, Nick is tiny compared to you. Like, he's got real narrow. He's got little waist, wider shoulders, right? Like, you're, he's a 165 in college, right? Like, he's a – and they bill him at some – like, 217 – there's no way he weighs over 195. There's no way he's shredded. You know what I mean? Like, and the um, you know, I was talking to him on the phone the other day, and he does this, dude. He does some cool workouts. You got to check them. He's a big uh, treadmill guy, treadmill guy. Not a run on the treadmill. He's he's a big incline, uh, empty stomach cardio, and he does he does a lot of sauna treadmill, sauna treadmill, lifts, and and does all this like that's his, his regiment. You understand, you got a fiance. This guy's a single 42 year old guy that lives alone. You know what I mean? Yeah. He ain't got a dog, he ain't got a cat. You know what I mean? And 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 I, I think his dog and cats are books. The dude reads a lot of books, you know what I mean? And I think I think his workout regiment and books are like that guy's main thing. And 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 WWE. Whereas like you watch all the stories about all the WWE guys that are partying, doing all this crazy stuff, right? I think he understands. Don't have a family that you're going to disappoint because what you guys do is so much what you're, what the, what you're embarking on right now, th dude, they used to put them on 300, 300, 320 days of travel. Yeah. What you think about that. What, what's 320 days of travel going to do to you? That's we'll a find out. I hope that's a, you know, I hope you find out, but like at the same time, that, that that's wild. Right. I mean, that that's a lot. Uh, and the bumps and the bumps are, yeah, ah, it's fake. It's all fake. It's written. No, you guys are taking, tell me how you jump off that, off the top rope or the top turnbuckle out of the ring and you land on the table. Sure. The table's cut. Sure. It's whatever. It's propish, right? You're still taking that bump, dude. When you guys hit that mat, you hit a, a, a little mat or you hit, the, I mean, that hurts. Oh yeah, I mean, I think like I think people miss uh, misunderstand sometimes. Like, yeah, it's a small wrestling mat on the outside. The the ring itself is a small piece of foam with two by twelves or two by tens under. You're basically falling onto a deck just over and over again. Like, it is not it is not for the faint of heart. It is rough, but like, I don't think there's a background that better prepares you than the sport of wrestling because. You know, if you wrestled at a high level in college, it was your season started in October. You know, you weren't done until March, but then you had the U.S. Open in April. And then you had to get ready for world team trials in June. And then, you know, whether you made the world team or Nick was bringing you over as a training partner for the world championships, you were going through September. And then guess what? It's October. It's time to get ready for college season again. And like this idea of 320 days on the road, you know. Uh, no off season, you know, that, that's what they like to say in this business, you know, you do WrestleMania on Saturday, Sunday, and then there's Monday night raw right after, like, we've been doing that stuff since we, you know, before we could read or write, like, that's all we know, like putting hands on another person, throwing someone, that's all we know. It, it's funny people at work will, or, you know, people outside of work will be like, man, don't you get nervous when you grab someone and you got to throw them or whatever? I said, you get nervous when you read or write a sentence? I said, not really. I said, I started throwing people before I could read or write. So, like, no, I don't really get too nervous for it, you know. Like, I think what we all do in the sport of wrestling, especially when you're in it and you're in that bubble, and I wish I could go back and tell myself this, like, when you're showering every day with the guys, you're working out every day with the guys, and when you're around 20 to 30 individuals who live that lifestyle, you don't realize how you're uh, the most uncommon people 
on earth, you know, living that type of lifestyle, that type of discipline, that type of regimen, that type of physical fitness, you know, both at the high school level and at the college level, I was doing that with, you know, my close friends and a, and a group of, of guys that, you know, it creates a brotherhood like no other. And even when you're still in the sport and you see people talking about it online or you're around, you know, division one coaches and stuff, they're cut from that same cloth. They operate on the same way. And then when you get away from it and you're in a different world, and you realize, like, not everybody works the way they do. Not everybody approaches and tackles every situation that same way. You're like, dude, I miss being around just, like, for lack of better terms, some people that are savages, man, that just go and attack stuff, you know, like they're juggernauts. Like, it doesn't matter if the wall is, is three layers thick. They're going to knock that thing down and get to the goal on the other side, you know, whether it's entrepreneurship, whether it's something for their family, whether it's for wrestling. Like, we're – uncommon men and to be at the peak of the sport you have to be the most uncommon of uncommon people and like i miss being around those people for sure it's just like what you're saying to your point that you got to be around a bunch of savages well that's what it takes you got if you you got to be a little different to be in the sport sport of wrestling changes you the sport of wrestling molds you it really like like what other sport are you just kicking the absolute committing felonies against your best friends and like you just said, you go back and you're you're showering and you're hanging out, you're talking, you're in the you're in the locker room and everyone's talking about what's going on and what you're doing in this class. Or it's crazy, man, to think about it. Like I forget about like 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 the locker room part about it. Like that is like where you guys you just you know like you just that's where you guys your buddies you talk the most. You know, it's like practice. You're not talking that much. You're goofing off and listening to music and beating each other up. But like before and after getting ready. That's really where, you know, you get to know people who you maybe don't know outside of the, of the, of the wrestling room. And the, that's where you get to know them. And that's where you form bonds, right. For lack of a better, lack of a better term. Right. Like, I mean, for sure, it's like awesome to think about it. And now they've got like sweet locker rooms. Like you guys have couches and all this other stuff. Ours, ours sucked. It was like wooden benches and stupid lockers and a gross shower room. But like now, man, every locker room's sweet and ducked out. You can take a nap on the couch. Right. That, yeah, that wasn't how it was when we first got to Duke. So, like, we kind of, you know, lack of a better term, we got it out the mud there at Duke for a little bit. We were grinders, man. And, like, it made you appreciate it more when we did get that stuff. Like, but it's funny, you know, we had all these different personalities. Like, I wasn't I'm far from a normal Duke kid, you know. I'm, I'm renovating my house right now. Like, I like doing just random stuff. But, like, we had kids that loved, like, anime and stuff. Not my thing. Not, not against it, not for it, whatever. Just not my thing. We had people who were you know, into something else. And it didn't matter as long as you worked hard. And like, you shared that sweat equity together. That's what bonded you. And actually Lucas Berg reached out this year and I was FaceTiming him coming home from a live event. And I'm just telling him, I'm like, look, dude, it doesn't make sense right now. I can try to harp on it all I want, but like, until you're away from it for a little bit, you're not going to understand it. Like, you know, the bus rides that suck right now because you're cutting weight. And there's guys on the team and some can eat and some can't. And like, you know, you're getting nauseous because like the fumes or what I said, you're going to look back. You're going to miss that one day. I said, you're going to miss being with your boys on a ride back after a duel when you guys win, or, you know, you're going to miss it. Even when the coaches come in, they rip you apart after you lose a duel and then punish you with the practice the next morning. Like you're going to look back and realize like those eight o'clock, seven o'clock AM workouts, and then having to do it again at four or five o'clock at night. And like, you were the most uncommon of uncommon men at some point. And like, you're going to miss all that. So like, just enjoy it, man. You know, whether it goes your way or whether it doesn't, either way, you're going to want to relive that moment. You're either going to want to relive it because it didn't go your way and you want to do it over again and get another shot at it, or it's going to go perfect, right? You're going to have the storybook ending and you're going to want to re relive that moment because it's just so great. But either way, man, you're going to want to be in this moment again. So just enjoy this moment because like, you know, before you know it, you'll be two guys on a podcast talking about how it was fun to be in the locker room at one point. Yeah, I never thought I'd talk to anybody else about showering with a bunch of dudes after wrestling practice. I never <laughs> thought that'd be a thing. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm going to put it out there. I'm going to be honest. But, um, I, dude, so, some of the stories I would hear, we had these two brothers on our team, Mark and Sean Wentz, that they would tell in our showers. I would just be like, where are, are you guys aliens? Where are you guys from? What is wrong with you two? Still fr great friends with them today. John lives out in Colorado. He's a trainer for the uh, Space Force. And uh, Mark Mark made a uh, Shaq sculpture of all the broken rims. That's Mark Wentz. See? 
Yeah. See the most uncommon of uncommon men. Yeah, it's just they're different guys, man. But like those guys are awesome guys, and I miss them. You know what I mean? I miss being, you know, talking to them, texting them, being around them, listening to their shower stories. You know? Dude, yeah, I mean. (laughs) <laughs> Mike Mock and Tommy Gant come came down here uh, and spent some time and like just hanging out with those dudes again. Like it gives you that hunger. Like you got Mock right now, right? He's in the final wax. He's one of the best dudes in the world. He's still my little brother. I would still put it on Mike Machiavello. That's an open challenge. That's a call out right there. I'm telling you, he came down here. I still gave him that work. I hope he wins the world title at 92 kilograms this year, but he's still my little brother. But being around those guys again, like, you, you miss that. And the, the Wolfpack RTC days, when you go in, you blaze up the shoes, you play a game to get going, you're ready to fist fight someone by the end of a game of handball or whatever it is, and then you go out and you just beat the crap out of each other for two hours and you go out to eat with each other afterwards. Like, dude, those those guys, you know, they, what do they say? Like, uh, blood makes you related, sweat makes you family or whatever. Like, that was the essence of it. Like, my, my parents blessed me with an older brother who's, you know, one of my best friends, a younger brother who's one of my best friends in the sport of wrestling, blessed me with another five, ten people that are my best friends. So I'm very, very grateful for that. Yeah, Mike Mock and, and Tommy Gank, two great guys, man. They don't make them better than those two guys, right? For sure. Nick Gwiz, all those guys. Yeah. My time at Duke, my time at NC State, again, didn't get what I wanted, but got what I needed. Yeah, the bonds, like you're talking about, these bonds that we've created with these guys who are our friends. And who, you'll be in their weddings and you'll, you'll be, you know, you're going to be everywhere where they're at and you're going to, you know, uh, it's just the bonds. You cannot, you cannot duplicate them. It's hard to, um, you don't get rid of them. You stay with those guys and you talk to those guys and you gravitate towards them in life. And you always want to know how their lives are going and how their families are doing. It's like, it's awesome to see it unfold, man. Like my wife and I, uh, so my, my wife, fed all of us the wrestling team after practice my wife had a meal card because she was a volleyball player and their coach was real big on equity you know title nine equity which they should be um and they gave the um they gave them football player meal cards so we couldn't run my wife's we could not run her uh card out so she would feed as many wrestlers as she could. And then she had another teammate, Colleen Donahue. Um, and then, you know, they would have, they had these cards that you could not run them out. We literally tried to run my wife's card out one year and we could not do it. We could not do it. And then at the end of the year, we went, we bought cases of Powerade. And then you got like a code where you would go on the site and they would mail you a Powerade towel. <laughs> Dang. So, That's so, when you knew she was a keeper, huh? When she, yeah, when she she's a real one. Team. She's a real one, right? Um <laughs> But, like, looking back on it, man, like, that stuff, I look forward to that. We talk about that. We still tell those stories about she took us all out to eat and fed us in the uh, cafeterias. And, you know, the, we we missed sitting around at a table for an hour and a half and just – no, nobody just left after they ate. You know, everybody hung out. Everybody was happy. Everybody wanted to be around everybody. It was just – it was awesome, man. It was just – I wouldn't trade it for anything. And, you know, that's why I'm so loyal to Kent State. I'm loyal to Kent State because – and everything I have, the way I look at it, everything I have in my life is, you know, partly due to Kent State, meeting my wife there. And, uh, you know, my nephew went there. I was able to trick my nephew into going there and <laughs> met his wife there. And it's just like, it's an awesome thing to see the progression of things. Now I got another nephew going there next year. So it, it's exciting <laughs> stuff, man. And it's just, and the place has been good to me and it's a blue collar place. You know what I mean? It's not like, it's not like an Ivy League. It's not like a Duke. You know what I mean? You just got a bunch of blue collar kids. Whereas you're saying you're bringing in kids with blue collar mentality who probably came from a white collar background, right? Yeah. Yeah. Or they, you know, blue collar kids that have worked hard enough to get a white collar opportunity. That's why I always looked at, you know, myself being, so I, I actually was born in Wheeling, West Virginia, and I grew up in the Ohio Valley until my dad took a, a different job. And then we moved up to Lexington, but I would have been like a St. Clairsville Red Devil or a Bellsville Blue Devil, which nobody even knows where Bellsville's at because it graduates like 20, 30 kids a grade. And St. Clairsville is a decent school. They had like Don Prezi and stuff, but we were very blue collar, you know, in that area, it's steel mill workers, it's coal miners, it's uh, pipeliners and stuff like that. So my parents took that kind of foundation and then got us to an area where there was more white collar opportunities. And I think that's kind of what happened for us, me and my brothers to have the success we've had. 
that's like an awesome thing that your parents, you know, were able to do that. And I did not know you were born down there in the Ohio River Valley. I, uh, I, I, I did not know that. I, I guess I didn't realize that. Um, how much younger is your brother Drew? Or Drew? Yeah, it's Drew, right? Yeah, yeah, Drew. Uh, so Drew and I are. Man, what is that? I uh, like nineteen or eighteen months apart. Two years. Uh, in he's school? younger by. I'm sorry. Two years in school. Yeah, we went two years in school. So he's a May birthday. So he either had to be young to graduate or old to graduate, and they made the right call to make him old. Um, so yeah, that he we're, we're like nineteen, and then my older brother and I are like twenty six months. Got it. And then what year did your older brother graduate? He graduated in eleven. Um, so he was two years older in school also, but he didn't wrestle uh throughout high school. He just wrestled going into high school. Gotcha. And then um so it's you three, you got an eleven, a thirteen, and a fifteen graduate. Is that right? Are those those high yep. school graduation years? Yes, sir. And then Drew was an all American at Otterbein, right? All American. He was number one undefeated going into the COVID uh, NCAA tournament. He was there warming up, and they canceled the tournament on him. That's right, they did. Yeah. No way, dude. Wow. He was, he was oh. undefeated state champ his senior year too. So I'm yeah, definitely that's proud right. of him. That's right. He was. Yes. What did he win state <laughs> at? Two fifteen. One eighty two. He beat Jack Harris, and then uh, Kyle Kremmiller was the champ at ninety five. He had beat Kyle Kremmiller too. So. Uh, he was the best guy in D2, without a doubt, and probably in the entire state that year. He was the champ champ. Yeah, I, I thought so, at least. So, when you were able to make your jumps, right, you make this jump from 184 to heavyweight. What would you get up to, and what would you cut down to from 184, and what would you be every week from cutting down? Would you cut from 200 every week? Yeah, at least. So. Oh. God. The story I like to tell when people ask me here at this new job about it, you, know, you wrestled 184? I said, yeah. They're like, dude, I can't believe that. I said, yeah, neither can I. There was a time we dueled UVA. So we get up to UVA. I'm wrestling Tyler Asty. So I'm working out with Coach Whistle. I get down to 184. We make weight. You know, it's the one hour weigh-in. So one hour, I make 184. Two hours for the duel, right? Say it was two hours for the entire duel. Three hours to get back from UVA to Duke. We get back. I'd been eating and drinking on the way back, you know, because I had just made weight. I needed to replenish. Coach Whistle goes, get on the scale. I'm like, yeah. He's like, no, seriously, get on the scale. I want to see what you weigh. So we're talking six hours later, and I was like 207, almost oh my 208. God. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, my yeah. God. 23 pounds, dude. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh my real, God. Real and uh, I got told, this is ridiculous. That's blah, 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 blah. And I did. Hold I on. Forward, Hold you know? on. They weren't wrong. Yeah, yeah, no, they weren't wrong. They, Let's they be honest, weren't they wrong. weren't wrong. But oh that was a regular occurrence. Uh, yeah, over 200 would be every single week. And you qualified at 184 once, qualified, yeah, my true sophomore year. Oh my god, dude, you're a lunatic. I love it. Yeah, it was rough. That was a rough year. So, like, the next thing when I when I look at you, your physique, the the style, I pulled a couple of clips up, man. I gotta be honest, I, I just I don't follow your guys' storylines, and I just don't follow. I, I mean, you're not, you don't seem offended, but like, no. I don't even know, I don't <laughs> even know what Nick's doing. Those, I don't even know what he's doing, and he's one of my best. I, I, he'll periodically, like once every four months, send us a clip of him taking like a massive shot or something. But normally, it's like it's just, just not what we talk about. You know what I mean? Right. We're, we, we talk about politics a lot. If you want the truth, him and I are, we are politics every day. Every day, that guy and I talk about politics every single day. Um, but, uh, you, you and him are always, it looks like you're always like right now, I feel like you could pull your shirt up and it'd be like Corey Gregory abs. Like, I always feel like you guys, like I, I ask him, I'm like, dude, are you always ready? Cause you know, you guys can do this stuff, right? You got to do these things all the time. These are shoots. A lot of these are shoots or it's like, you're going out. There's nothing. People are seeing you from every angle in an arena. There's spotlights yeah. everywhere, right? You know, I got a dad bod, so I'm just like, whatever. But I'm not on TV with my dad bod. You guys look like you're ready to do a photo shoot and you're ready to perform every day. It doesn't look like, and that's like a credit to you guys, how you live and how you your diet and, and just uh, like you're saying, like how you live, right? You live this. How are you able to do that? And 
am I wrong with the Corey Gregory abs right now? Could you do the alien ab thing right now? Is it, is it always like that? Or do you got to get pumped up and like, how does it, how does it work backstage to go out and look how you guys look, you guys look amazing. How do you, how do you stay like that? Yeah, thank you. Uh, Coach Lamb used to always tell me you don't have to get ready if you stay ready. And uh, that was just, it's kind of something that stuck with me. And it's like, you know, I always am doing what I feel like I need to do to be ready. Uh, another guy, uh, Rich Holland is his WWE name. I was picking his brain early on in my career. And he said, your opportunity is going to come when you least expect it, when you're least ready for it. So like, and maybe it gives you a little anxiety at times too, but I'm, I'm always thinking like that. You know, you can ask, you know, my fiance, Courtney, I'm always like, you know, man, I got, I got to put some more size on her, man. I need to lean back out. I need to do this. And like, you're always cognizant of it in, in a lot of ways, but like at the same time, I'm also living life. I'm renovating a house right now. You know, uh, when I do get a little bit of free time, I'm spending it with my friends and stuff. So like your body fluctuates and you, you go up and you go down and you lean out and then you, you put some weight on and some fluff. But like, I think more so it's just, I think if you ask your body to give a lot, it'll give you a lot. And if you don't ask for much, you'll never know what it's capable of. And right now, you know, I run my body really, really hard. Um, but even like tonight, so I, I, we performed last night, we had a match, had a solid match in my opinion. Uh, I woke up, went in, got a massage, uh, lifted, did about two and a half hours in ring, did uh, some film study today, came home. I took like a two hour nap, woke up, showered again, came down here and did this. But like, I'll sleep eight plus hours tonight. I'm making sure I'm eating right. I'm making sure I'm hydrating right. You know, might work on the house for a little bit, might not like, but I'm always go, go, go. But I'm also doing the right recovery stuff, I think, to be able to allow it. You know, I think, you know, if you ask Dolph, he might feel a little differently, you know, given his place, given his income and everything. He might have a little bit uh, different answers, his travel schedule. But as, as far as it's concerned here, I think that's kind of, you don't have to get ready if you stay ready. And right now, all the tools are at my disposal, you know, access to a gym all the time, access to the rings all the time. And right now, it's kind of that pursuit of always trying to uh, trying to perfect your craft right now, because I know I'm not as good as I can be. So, like, I'm always just putting in work. Are you at the gym more than you need to be? Are you like, because I just feel like that's just your personality. I feel like just like your, your savage grinder mentality, your Ohio River Valley, Mansfield, Lexington uh, mentality. I feel like you're probably there more than you need to be. Um, is that true? Are you working more than you're supposed to? It just feels like your nature. Is that what you're doing? Yeah, I mean, definitely in this career, I was doing it early on. I actually kind of had like a revelation around New Year's. And um, who was I was actually around Miles Martin, weirdly enough, down in Miami with Mike Mock and Tommy Gant. We were talking about like training schedules and like, you know, you're talking about a guy that that reached the pinnacle of college athletics um, and just picking his brain on it. I'm like, no offense to him, no offense to anyone on Ohio State's team, whatever. I'm like, dude, I trained way harder than these dudes in college. And I started thinking about it. I'm like, even when I coached, I had a better feel on it because I could rope my guys in. And, you know, my coaches had a feel on it, but they also knew that I needed it for my own psyche. I was a guy that overtrained, like, um, you know, chronically. And I started to realize around New Year's this year that I was overtraining for this. And they say, they have a saying in this business, the best ability is availability. You got to be ready to go. You got to be healthy. You got to be able to perform. And if you're overtraining like that, and you're not actually going to be able to go out and give 100%. Do I go up early and put in extra work? Yes. Do I stay late and put in extra work? Yes. Am I overtraining as much as I used to? No. So I've definitely cut back on it. You know, there was a point in college, there was a Tuesday after I won Southern Scuffle the first time my junior year. I was, uh, I woke up, we did conditioning. Then I went to the room and I drilled. And then I went, came back and did an individual, uh, got a lift in, and then came back and did team practice. And Monday, I beat Coach Whistle pretty solid in a match. And then Tuesday, on the fifth workout, we wrestled a match. I beat him like 2-1 or 3-1. Or I don't remember what it was. And it might have even been an overtime. I sat down on the wall, you know, and I'm a baby sometimes. And I'm like, like basically tearing up because I'm so frustrated. I was trying so hard to beat this dude and put it on him like I did the day before. And I just couldn't. He's, he got in my ear like, what do you expect, dude? This is your fifth workout of the day. Like, you're doing too much right now. You're not listening. You got to ease off of the gas. But, like, I was so worried 
that winning Southern Scuffle, uh, you know, was a fluke and that I wasn't going to do it come NCAA time. Or I was a guy that was going to have success at one point and then not be able to replicate it. And uh, especially after you win a big tournament like Southern Scuffle. That year I went through Everard, Dejernet, um, Schaefer, and Krolls. So three guys that were in the top 10, four guys that were in the top 20 to win that tournament. And I was like a nobody before that tournament. It made me overnight. And funny enough, Jerry Briscoe was there recruiting for the WWE. So it really made me. Um, but, you know, I, I had that feeling of success. And I said, I don't want to ever go back to not feeling it. And I was willing to work as hard as it needed to be um, to the point where I was probably working too hard. And I started to do the same thing in this business. Like you start to get success and, and it consumes you and it and still consumes me. But it's a constant battle. Like, I don't think there's anything in my life that I'm going to do halfway. So I think it's a good thing. It's, it's who I am. But also I have to be aware of that. So we can say it's safe to say you're a Briscoe boy. I'm a Bristol boy through and through. Okay. So Denzel Dejernet, you beat him. When you beat him, he's App State's uh he was all American. Was he eighth? Was he eighth for him, I want to say? I believe so. Yeah, he yeah. lost to Krolls, I think, for seven and eighth. Okay. So you beat both those guys. Um Dejernet, I want to say, is he still in or did he get released? I can't remember. I can't. Yeah, he's no longer with the company, but yeah, he was here for a while. Okay. So he was with the company for a couple years, right? Yes, sir. So that guy, you know, he, he had a run at it. Um, and now we're looking at Gable Steveson, right? And you're talking about overworking and you're talking about talent. If we're talking pure talent, right? Pure talent, it's it's not, it doesn't translate like everybody thinks it does. So this is what I'm going to tell you. I, I always say like, like you ask, ah, what about if it's me and Dolph Ziggler? I'm like, yeah, you're going to kill him. You're going to break his bones and going to need a new hip or whatever right gable can kill everybody in your business he can take brock lesnar and wear him and beat him like a like a drum okay he can wear him out pull on his head get him tired blast double leg him whatever right he can do all that we all get that right that doesn't matter that doesn't matter in your guys's business what matters in your business is who's going to grind who's going to give the outcomes they need to go take the push when they get a push right Take the bumps when they need to take the bumps. I think that I don't think it's like everybody just thought he was going to come over and be written in as the WWE champion. That's just not how it works. That's just not how it works. And your business is it's a cruel business, man. It's a tough business, man. It's not always fair over there. But like, I just don't think I think everybody just thought the Gable effect was just going to like hit like a tsunami and he was just going to take over and be the guy. What are your thoughts on that? And, and have you had any work with Gable Steveson? Yeah, Gable's been around. I think, you know, uh, first and foremost, he's maybe the most talented individual we've ever seen. Um, he's a total and, freak. He's a mutant. And what you guys are doing is <laughs> it is not it is a, it has a predetermined outcome. And it's not always the Gable Stevenson best athlete in the world is going to win. It's going to be who who's who they're pushing and who's written to win. I don't think people get that. And but it's real at the same time. It's real at the same time. The bumps are real, man. Yeah, there's a, there's you know there's a lot that does go into it, and a lot more than you even realize without being here every day. And it doesn't make sense from from the inside looking out. You can never explain it, and from the outside looking in, you can never. Uh, it'll never make sense, you know, type deal. Oh, um, my assessments. What I'm saying is, am I am I even close? Yeah, no, no, you're 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 not completely off. Um, but there's an entertainment value, right? So first and foremost. Gable Stevenson is probably the most talented American wrestler of all time. And I think there are certain times in life where, you know, Mark Henry talks about in his documentary, he said, I honestly believe, and I believed at the time that God put me on this earth to be the strongest man to walk on the earth. 